We often think of Pentecost as the birthday of the church. In our church service we might sing happy birthday, decorate with red banners and red balloons, organise cake with red icing and celebrate the birthday of the church. But what do you say after you've sung happy birthday? What does the celebration of Pentecost signify? I want to talk about what I think are four significant aspects of this Pentecost story here in Acts chapter 2. Here's the first one. Around this narrative there's a strange interplay between speaking and silence. Speaking is a crucial part of the Pentecost account. It starts in Acts chapter 1, where the risen Jesus makes the very important declaration, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Pentecost story in Acts chapter 2 delivers on Jesus' promise of power for witnessing. The Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost as power. Particularly, it comes as power for speaking. The first sign of this empowerment for speaking is in verse 4. All those who were gathered in the house were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And the assembled folks hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. The Spirit empowers all sorts of people to speak about God's deeds. But after verse 11, things get strange. Speech gives way to silence. After the Spirit empowers men and women to speak, suddenly they all get silenced. And in verse 14, only one person, Peter the Apostle, is talking. Peter preaches the Pentecost sermon to interpret what is happening. He starts in verse 14, and he's still preaching at verse 40, some 25 verses later. But only Peter is speaking now. But it gets even stranger. In verses 17 and 18, just a couple of verses into his sermon, Peter quotes from the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, says God, sons and daughters, young men and old men, male slaves and female slaves. It sounds like the spirit equips everyone, all flesh, to speak about God's mighty acts, regardless of gender, regardless of social status. Everyone gets to talk. But if we read on through the book of Acts, this vision of everyone speaking for God disappears. Silence takes over. We don't see in Acts any women preachers or slave preachers. Mostly we see the male apostles who are speaking. Many are silenced. So we have the speaking in silence, spirit-inspired speech and proclamation by all, yet many who could be speaking about God's deeds of power are not presented as speakers of the good news. They are silenced. There's a challenge here for churches. The Spirit equips all to speak the powerful acts of God. How many talkers of the good news of the mighty acts of God do we have among us? What structures do we need that enable folks to speak the good news? How do we clear a space that enables the Spirit to turn our frequent silence into appropriate speaking? Here's a second dimension. This Acts chapter 2 narrative emphasizes that Pentecost is about the gift of divine presence, a theme that I think is especially of concern for some contemporary believers who find God's presence often to be elusive and mystifying. The Spirit's coming in Acts chapter 2 is associated with wind and fire, biblical symbols of God's presence. Moses encountered God in the burning bush. In the Exodus, the people encounter God in the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Elijah encounters God at Mount Horeb in wind and fire. Throughout the biblical tradition, there are all sorts of encounters with God. Sometimes very obvious presence. Sometimes very elusive. Sometimes very disruptive and confrontational. Sometimes very gentle and reassuring. Sometimes oppressive presence. Sometimes apparent absence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's worth pausing to think about this Pentecost scene and the theme of God's presence. The scene makes God's presence so clear and evident no one could miss it. It's overwhelming and powerful and in your face and out your mouth sort of presence. But for some of us, divine presence is much more elusive and mystifying, much more difficult to discern much more difficult to experience.
Some of us know much more about the experience of divine absence than divine presence. Some of us know much about God as an oppressive presence. How does the spectacular Pentecost scene speak to such as these? How do we engage its confident assertions of divine presence along with the biblical record of struggles with divine absence? The interplay of divine presence and absence. Here's a third one. The interplay of tradition and new experience. Acts chapter 2 narrates the coming of the promised spirit by borrowing language and traditions from the biblical tradition. It employs these borrowed traditions to interpret, to make sense of this event of the coming of the Spirit. The clearest example of the borrowed language and tradition comes in the setting for this speech-empowering event. Pentecost was an established festival. It was the festival of weeks or first fruits occurring seven weeks after Passover. The significance of the Pentecost festival changes through the tradition, but one thing remains constant. It's associated with God giving good gifts. At first, Pentecost was a festival that celebrated the harvest. It recognized, according to Exodus 23 and Leviticus 23, God's gift of wheat and animals such as lambs and bulls and rams and goats. People offered the first fruits of the harvest to God. They offered it in, th in thanksgiving for God's faithfulness in supplying the harvest. Deuteronomy 16 celebrated that God gave these gifts of food to everyone associated with the household, sons and daughters, male and female slaves, strangers, orphans and widows. But then the significance of Pentecost changes. Somewhere, somehow, Pentecost came to be associated with Sinai and the theophany or the manifestation of God to Moses and the gift of the Ten Commandments. Pentecost becomes a time to give thanks for the making of the covenant, for the giving of instructions for faithful living within the covenant. But then Pentecost takes on a third meaning. Just as Pentecost was associated with God giving the gifts of harvest and of covenant in Torah, so now Pentecost is associated with God giving the gift of the Spirit. God provides harvest. God provides instruction for faithful living. God provides God's Spirit that empowers faithful witness and manifests God's presence. God gives what God's people need. The interplay of silence and speech, the interplay of divine presence and absence, the interplay of traditions and new experience, and fourth and finally, the interplay of scriptures and experience. This theme emerges from Peter's sermon where Peter interprets the scriptures in relation to the Pentecost experience. Scriptures that have spoken to folks over centuries in different contexts and in different ways are now interpreted in relation to this event. Notice, for example, in verse 16 of chapter 2, Peter references the prophet Joel speaking about how God will in the last days pour out God's Spirit on young and old, men and women. Peter uses the passage to interpret what has happened at Pentecost as a sign of the last days, the drawing near of the goal of God's purposes, the last days are underway. Then in verse 25, Peter quotes from Psalm 16, the last few verses. This is a psalm that has addressed countless people across the ages. The psalmist expresses confidence and trust in God to protect him and keep him alive in difficult circumstances. Peter reinterprets the psalm very narrowly and specifically. He reads it with his Jesus glasses on and sees it as a reference to God's resurrecting power. While the psalmist gives thanks that God saved him even from death, Peter interprets these verses in relation to God's power bringing Jesus up from the dead after the crucifixion. Reading the psalm in this way, Peter provides scriptural proof for God's raising of Jesus. This matters because in verses 34 and 35 he goes on to read Psalm 110 with his Jesus glasses on. The risen Jesus gives the Spirit. What we see happening here with Joel and with these Psalms is the early Christian movement reading the scriptures in relation to Jesus. Other readers and groups did the same thing and read the scriptures in relation to their circumstances and convictions across the centuries. The group at Qumran, for example, does it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
But here Acts reads Joel and the Psalms in relation to Jesus and the gift of the Spirit. The same process continues to this day as we read the scriptures in relation to our own lives and experiences. These four dimensions of this Pentecost scene invite us to reflect on our own experience of the Spirit, the interplay of silence and speech, the interplay of divine presence and absence, the interplay of traditions and new experience, and the interplay of scriptures and experience. The Spirit provokes new experiences and new understandings. New structures and new life emerge. What is the Spirit doing in contemporary churches and in our own lives?